All right, uh, welcome back. It's good to see everybody. Uh, and as always, thanks for covering Wake Forest football. Uh, you know, just recapping Duke, uh, obviously uh, extremely disappointed with the outcome. You know, we talked before the game about playing with emotion, but not emotional. And I thought we did some great things for three quarters. And, you know, one down to down, scrimmage to scrimmage, but two turnovers in the fourth quarter. We had two missed field goals. We had three 15 yard penalties. And when you make mistakes like that, you don't deserve to win. So that was a, a painful lesson. Um, you know, and it's it's football, and you know we've won games, we've won probably more games like that when we lost, and that's why, you know, it's so disappointing to lose like that because that's not been our brand. But credit to Mike and Duke, uh, you know, they they played smarter and took better care of the ball down the stretch and didn't commit penalties, and and that turned out to be the difference in the game. So we go from one in-state rival to another. Um, we'll have Senior Day. Uh, this uh, Saturday, this is our last home game of the year, and it's always uh, great to, to play NC State. It's a rivalry game. We've met every year since 1910. Um, you know, again, with the additions of the new school in the league and the new scheduling model, I'm really pleased that this rivalry will continue. That was one of the things with the old scheduling model um, that I wasn't excited about. Um, is not being able to keep playing NC State. And it's certainly not because we don't have great respect for him. You know, Dave's done an unbelievable job there. You know, Dave and I were in the MAC together when he was at Northern Illinois and I was at BG and, and he got to the ACC a year ahead of me. But congratulations to him on breaking the all time wins record at NC State. It's a great accomplishment. Um, you know, to make it 11 years at a power five school in this day and age is, is really hard to do. And, and Dave has done a great job. They've been consistent winners. And, um, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him and he's, he's done an outstanding job there. Uh, you know, they're a good football team. You know, they, they had a tough game against Duke and, and credit to Dave and his staff, they got their players back. So after to lose to Duke the way they lost that football game and come back and beat Clemson and Miami in back-to-back -back weeks is really a great coaching job by Dave and his whole staff and their whole program. You know, you have a game like that, it's like, are you gonna get off the mat? And, and they've responded in a, uh, a really big way. Those are two great wins for their program. You know, they're six and three. Uh, they've been one of the better programs in the ACC over my time here. And, uh, you know, with them, it starts on defense. Tony Gibson does an outstanding job. You know, they run that 3-3 stack, multiple looks. He knows the defense well. They execute at a high level. You know, I'd be shocked if Peyton Wilson isn't the ACC Defensive Player of the Year. He's got 105 tackles, TFLs, sacks. He's all over the field, interceptions. Um, you know, up front, they're really good. You know, Vaughn, Clark, Jackson, Price. All those guys are really good players. And they play that three-man front, and they know what they're doing, and they've got big bodies. And then they've always had good linebackers, you know, and they, they lose Isaiah Moore, um, and, and they lose, uh, who was the, the other linebacker that tackled everything, who? Drake Thomas. Drake Thomas, I can't believe I can't remember his name. It was going against him for four years wasn't fun. Um, you know, and they come back this year and, uh, you know, Jalen Scott is a heck of a player and really productive. And uh, they're, they're always good in the secondary. Aiden White is one of the better corners in the, uh, in the ACC. Shaheen Battles played a lot of football for him. Uh, you know, Boykin has been, seems like every time you watch the film, he's, he's got an interception or making a big play. And, uh, and because of how they are on defense, they're able to play a, a, a certain way on offense. You know, they're always big and physical up front. Robert and I is one of the most creative offensive coordinators I've ever faced. They're doing a great job of moving the Concepcion kid around. He lines up as a slot, as a quarterback in the backfield, as an outside receiver. Um, he's very productive. You know, the running backs are really good players as well. Um, you know, they've got good receivers. They've all had good skill. And uh, I just heard the, the quarterback is not going to be playing, but you know, Brennan Armstrong, 
you know, when we faced him at Virginia, we know how talented he is. And uh, this is another group that's, you know, they're always good in the kicking game. So uh, we got to bounce back against a very good football team, our last home game. And uh, we look forward to the challenge. So with that, I'll take any questions. With, uh, with our coming back, do you think, you know, he's going to want to prove something? I mean, he could be on the bench. Is that a concern at all? Or what kind of do you, do you have to do when you get a new guy like that? I mean, he's a good football player. And... You know, I, I wouldn't say they're as quarterback driven as most people, as most offenses. Like Robert and I just going against them at Virginia and Syracuse is just so creative. I mean, there's six formations that I've never seen before that we'll see on Saturday. You know, he just is, you know, and, and he's very personnel driven. You know, when they had the tight end last year at Syracuse, uh, Gladson, um, he moved them all over and found different ways of getting him the football. And he's really doing that with the Concepcion, uh, Casey Concepcion. They're just moving them all over the place. And so whether it's they find him the way to get the ball on screens or, you know, he's going to run a jet sweep every game or they get him in the slot and they get him matched up. And then, you know, they'll motion him into the backfield and they'll use him as a distraction. They'll fake the jet sweep and they'll have a whole play action series off it. And, you know, again, it starts up front. These guys are always one of the bigger, more physical offensive lines. I mean, all those guys are, you know, usually over 300 and 6'6", and they've had some good O-linemen there. So, um, you know, I'm sure it'll change a little bit what they do. But Brendan Armstrong, I think, is a heck of an athlete, a good competitor. You know, certainly seen him on film enough and know what he's capable of. And you always prepare for the best version of what you're going to see. Well, what didn't work is we turned the ball over. You know, we had the ball twice at midfield with a chance to go up two scores or get the game-winning points, and we turned it over. And and that's the um, you know the the the, the turnovers just drive me. They just they kill me because our first two years here we were negative turnover margin. I think the first year we were like minus two, and the second year we were like minus thirteen. And over the next six years, we were twice, we were the number one turnover margin team in the ACC. Twice we were second and once we were third. We were like plus, over that six year period, we were like plus 18 or plus 20. Um, and we've just lost our way with that. And at Wake Forest, you can't lose your way with that. And so, like our big thing is the ball is the program. We, we emphasize ball security. We spend time on it every day. And then when we're not bought into it, we don't do that. We're, we're at a severe disadvantage. And so I was excited that we moved the ball against a really good defense. Um, I thought in some ways, Mitch had his most productive game against a power five high level football team in the ACC, but you gotta be able to do it for 60 minutes. So we just keep pounding the same drum, and at some point, hopefully it'll sink in. But it's uh, very frustrating to me as a coach that the reason we lost the Georgia Tech game is the same reason we lost the Duke game. It's the same reason we lost the Virginia Tech game. When you can't take care of the football, especially at Wake Forest, you're not going to win football games. To get that stuff doesn't show up in practice? No. No, but, you know, Practice is different, Connor, and that's, you know, you're, you're you know, you get thinking about, you, you know, you don't want to go live on your quarterbacks because it's the one position in football that can't protect itself, okay? But in games, they're live, you know, and you just start thinking about, okay, how can we better prepare our quarterbacks for live games when they go through spring practice and they go through fall camp and nobody's allowed to hit them? And, uh, I've always struggled with that, that, you know, to get a guy game ready. But if you're the quarterback and the left tackle gets off the ball late or misses a pass rush, you're unprotected and you could be out for the year. And back, you know, 30 years ago when I started coaching and quarterbacks were live in practice, you'd go live and you'd lose your quarterback for the year in a preseason scrimmage. I mean, that's happened. I've lost guys for months and again it's it's a position that cannot protect itself 
you know, when you're back there and there's a blindside guy coming, you're a sitting duck. Um, so, you know, you try to do a lot of drills that mimic that stuff. But when you do those drills, they know it's coming, you know? So it's, uh, it's a balance and it's no different. We don't coach it any differently that, than we were number one and number two in the league for all those years. So, but sometimes when you're playing for the first time, you know, John Wolford was like that his first two years here. You know, and, and I mean, I remember that Louisville game in 2015 of same thing. We had the lead, we were out playing them, and we gave the game away. Um, and then in 16, he stopped doing that, and we started going to bowl games. So we're going to continue to coach it and work through it, and hopefully at some point it'll sink in. But obviously I'm not doing something right because I get up here and I, I sing the same song every week. So n nobody's bothered by it more than I am. Um, and I don't blame anybody but myself for allowing it to happen. Michael has said this is definitely his last home game. Can you talk about him and his you know, staying with the program and what he's, what he's gone through? He's awesome. He's, uh, you know, it's, Michael's so old now and been here so long that the relationship has changed. He's been a captain, I think, three years. He's just so mature. Uh, he get, He's just one of those guys that gets it. You know, I mean, this week you have a quarterback not playing, and here's a six-year guy that could be in the NFL or making a few hundred thousand dollars, you know, on Wall Street or Main Street or whatever he wanted to do, and he's still here with his teammates playing college football and uh, you know he's I say this at times he's everything that's right about college football he's going to leave here with two degrees a certificate he's done an internship he's an all academic ACC player he's a three-time captain he's an all ACC player and he's humble smart um, appreciative you know I just the way college football is going, I'd, I'd hate if we start losing the Michael Jurgens because this is what makes it fun to coach. So I think guys like him are going to become more and more rare as this thing progresses. Much of the season you've had your defense carrying a huge part of the load in the game while the offense struggled. Thursday, the defense with the penalties was a huge part of the problem while the offense played much better. Does it feel like you're coaching different seasons in one in one calendar? No, I mean we're we're the least penalized team in the ACC. Like that hasn't been a problem. If you look at the you know the last two, three, four years, I mean we're, we're always the least penalized team. And again, I just believe at Wake Forest, you know, we have to get enough talent here that if we take care of the football and don't beat ourselves, we'll win our share of games. And when we turn the ball over and we beat ourselves, we're probably not going to win a lot of games. We're not going to be able to overcome that. Um, and for a lot of years here, we didn't do those things. And we were able to go to seven straight bowl games and have some big wins against really good football teams. And uh, in this year, you know, at different times we've lost our way. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, I always look at myself and say, what could I do better? Um, we're playing a lot of guys that have never played before. So, I mean, you, you look at those penalties and it's a freshman and it's a first time starter. Um, and, you know, th those guys, they learn the hard way. And we did a lot of those things early, and a lot of times first-year players, they get into the heat of the moment. And, you know, that, what is the front part of your brain, the cortex, that when you have an emotional reaction, it processes of what you shouldn't do so you don't have an instant reaction. You know, sometimes that doesn't kick in in the fourth quarter of a rivalry football game. And when that doesn't kick in, every single person that sits in this room pays the price of it. So it was addressed. Um, you know, in a very direct fashion about when you do things like that, it's selfish. And everybody in this room uh, who plays, works for, is associated with Wake Forest football pays a very, very expensive price. You know, that you put 
all this work into it year round for 12 games and you have a chance to win a game in the fourth quarter against a good football team that's a rival and because we lost control of our emotions that cost us in part the football game now turnovers missed field goals you know i never blame one person or one thing but if you don't you know if you hit those two field goals if you don't turn over one of those balls if you don't commit one of those penalties you know i'm up here maybe smiling and joking today about how great it was to to beat a team so that's that's the fine line that we live on here and we were on the wrong side of that margin of error. With a team of uh, a roster of players that have been around, whether they started or not, uh, really the issue they've been here for a year, do you find that they tend to discipline each other also? Is there, aside from the players who committed the penalties hearing from you, do they hear from their teammates as well? Yeah, they do. And, you know, you're, it's, it's that balance, right, of, of being hard and expressing disappointment, but not giving up on a player. So, you know, there's definitely some tough love, but it's got to come from a place of love that the guys that committed those penalties um, are good football players and they're good people that have worked hard. And I'm not going to let one moment overshadow all the good things they've done this year. I mean, Deshaun Jones is having a good season for us and he's really developing. He's come a long way and he reacted poorly in the moment. And Aiden Hall is gonna be an outstanding linebacker here. And that guy, as a freshman, watches as much film and is in the weight room extra and dearly loves football. And we put him in there at a critical time because we trusted him and he didn't react the right way. And I'm pretty sure he'll never do that again. But that's... Uh, you know, I, I don't think Dylan Hazen or Quincy Bryant would have committed that same mistake this year, but maybe in the past they would have when they first played. So that's part of the learning and growth process. You're good. Um, Michael Jarvis noticed that practices the last couple of weeks have been really good. I guess I'm just curious, what's the mindset and focus of the team as you go? Final three games, you've got to win two to, to get to the game. <coughs> What are you seeing in terms of focus and mindset? I mean, I see a team that's still working, that still cares about each other, that shows up every day and is trying to get better. Um, this hasn't been our best season. I think our leadership this year has been as good as it ever was. I mean, Michael Jurgens and Malik Mustafa are two of the strongest captains we've ever had here. And when you're, you know, eight and one or nine and one at this point in the season, it's easy to lead. When you're four and five, it's harder. And those guys have done a great job of keeping the team together. Michael Jurgens has found his voice this year. I think when Sam and Blake were here last year, you know, but now he's the one returning captain. And uh, he's not afraid to express his opinion or say what needs to be stated. Um, and sometimes he gets on people and sometimes he's positive. And with Chase Jones out, Malik has really on defense been the guy who has become the voice in the room. And he got on Aiden and then loved him up. So it's still fun to go to practice every day less. It really is. I mean, that's the joy in the job for me is every morning I get up and I come in here and I meet with the team and I look at the players in this room and we've got great young men that continue to work and do things right um, and they're fun to be with. And then when practice is over, all the other stuff I got to deal with that I don't enjoy as much, but at least I have the mornings. So I'm so glad that we practice in the morning because I wake up in a good mood and my good mood continues up until about one, two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I have to deal with all the other crap that, you know, having play, you know, players inform us that other schools are already reaching out to them, offering in this, offering it that. I mean, it's just an absolute junk show. Um, it's like we're, we're getting hit with it already. I mean, it's, we're a month away from the portal and guys are already getting hit up. So third parties, NIL agents, whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's insanity. Um, but uh, you got to adapt, embrace it, and work through it. And hopefully we can keep a lot of these guys here because we only start four seniors. If you look at our roster right now, you know, on offense, the only two seniors that start are uh, Michael Jurgens and Spencer Clapp. 
Um, and on defense, uh, you know, the two seniors are uh, Chalen Garns and, and Jacob Roberts. And so, you know, we potentially could have 18 starters back and your whole kicking rotation. And that excites me. Now, what goes on in the next month? I'm sure some of those guys will declare for the draft and some of them are already being contacted and being offered different packages to go to different schools. Although it's not pay for play. Um, it's, uh, it's just, you know, this is what you do as a head coach in college in 2023, but we have really good kids here and uh, I hope we can keep most of them. I hope we can finish the year strong because that would certainly help us set a, a tone going into next year. And then I hope we can keep a lot of the players here. And if that happens, I, I think we'll, we'll get going in the right direction again. You mentioned in passing Chase Jones, and I know on your radio show three or four weeks ago, you said you've gotten a slightly better report about him. I haven't really heard anything since. Is there any hope of him seeing the field before the season's over? I mean, he's still not cleared. So like I said, I, I let the medical people make medical decisions. I was being given a glimmer of hope about two or three weeks ago. And uh, I'm not going to say it's dimmed, but it hasn't gotten any brighter. Big picture question, Tony. Let's go, man. Come on, like, let's get a big picture question. Uh huh. But since you bring it up, I'm to the point now if you don't ask it, I'm kind of disappointed. Just put it out there that you've got players who are being contacted already by agents to go in the portal, other schools to go. I, again, the what's real and what's not? It's you know, it's always hard to tell of what's real, what's liars poker, you know. But players are are sharing with people in the building that they are getting contacted by other people, and based on what happened last year, I have every reason to believe it's true. Okay, then let's then let me let me take a step to the side. Then last week you spent significant time on, I believe it was Les's question, about what it looks like with you having these conversations with these players. And hopefully the Wake Forest limitations are not as limiting going forward as they have been in the past. I don't know if you saw uh, Jake Dicker mm -hmm. from Washington State, his, his press conference was. I watched it and I thought of your conversation here last week. It seems almost like you and maybe some others are making a clarion call to the boosters step up before we lose some of these. Guys. I'm not making any call at all. I'm being transparent with the reality of college football in 2023. Um, I did see a minute snippet of uh, the head coach at Washington State, and I thought he was extremely articulate, very matter of fact. I didn't look at it as a cry for help. He's just explaining what his challenges are. And we have very similar challenges here. Um, and again, it's getting better. I'm incredibly uh, thankful for our donors and their generosity and everything they've done. I mean, look at the facilities we have compared to 10 years ago. And that's all been by donors. That's not money from the school. That's not coming from any tuition dollar. Those are all outside uh, boosters that have done all this. And now this is the next evolution of college football. And I just think, you know, the, the whole thing right now, it, it's just a mirage. Like, you know, the, it's not pay for play. I mean, who's full and who? We have a system set up that it's clearly pay for play. All this money's being generated. And yet we have to raise money from third party sources for the pay for play. And then, you know, guys are just opting out whenever they want to opt out. Um, you know, and, and again, this model is working really well for the select few. I mean, there's certain schools I'm sure that don't want this to change, you know, and, and he was getting into how many X's other schools have. I mean, there's probably 10 to 20 schools, right, that are just playing a different game than everybody else. Um, but I think a lot of us would just say, let's say what it is. It is professional football. It is pay for play. OK, and, you know, at some point, if we can get to revenue sharing and players are on contracts and they have an obligation because they're getting paid for that obligation.
So I think that's where this is headed. Um, you know, how long it takes to get there, who knows? You know, but the, the whole thing of, like I said last week, it, it's not amateur football, it is professional football at the college level. And that, that's where this thing is heading. And, and I don't see it, it going in a different way. Now, does it change how much I enjoy the job? No, I still think our players are great. I'm still, I, I played division three football. I worked at a landfill, you know, whatever, 14, 16 weeks in a summer so I could help pay for college so, so I could play football. So my entry into this profession and my background is a lot different than a lot of people that have the job I do. Um, you know, I think I'm still a little bit maybe idealistic, uh, maybe not realistic. You know, I'm becoming a little bit more pragmatic the longer I do this. But I don't know, I still like it when we have senior days and the guys that walk down and shake my hand have college degrees. That is still meaningful to me. And I'm still proud that most of our guys at Wake Forest leave with degrees, almost all of them. We've still not had a player fail out of here academically. Our GPA is well over a 3.0. Our APR is in the 990s. And so we are doing the very best job we can of continuing to try to run a college football program that going to class, getting an education, getting a degree, setting yourself up for the rest of your life with a great education from Wake Forest University is still the primary selling point and message. And obviously we need to supplement it with a little more than that to keep it going. Dave, you mentioned you have a lot of friends in the profession. Do you think that some of them, are, that this is driving some of them out? Oh, it's hard to say. I, you know, it's... No, I mean, it's... Like, you, you talk to all of them, it's like the, the joy of being with the players and being out there every day, boy, it's still awesome. I mean, I love that. Like, every day I have the same, you know, I, I come in, I make my cup of coffee, I go to the special teams meeting, you know, it's up here, and we talk about, you know, how we're going to try to block a punt or how we're going to run the return and the things we need to do to win the game. And then you go out there and you see the game plan put together and you see players laughing and enjoying themselves and the camaraderie. And that's why I got into it. And that part of it, I still love. And not doing that, I can't picture it. Now, like with any job, you know, to enjoy the good, sometimes you gotta tolerate the other things maybe you don't enjoy as much. Um, and I do that because of how much I enjoy what the core job still is. And I enjoy who I do it with, our staff. I enjoy who I get to coach, our players. I think the world of our training staff, our strength coaches. I mean, it's, you know, it's still really, really enjoyable. It just has a lot of new challenges. And the challenges that you have, they're everywhere. You know, the challenges at Ohio State and Alabama are different than they are at a, a Wake Forest or a BC or a Washington State. So we're all challenged in different ways, and my job is to navigate and manage those challenges and lead our football program the best way I can. To follow up on Tony's question, have you seen the offers kind of distract the team from its goals? No, I don't think so. I, I think, uh, you know, you, you like it. I think when players share those things, they're kind of indicating they'd like to stay. So anytime those things get shared, I don't get mad or upset. I'm like, it's awesome that we have an environment here that the players are comfortable sharing that. I think if they didn't share it, I'd worry because that means they're probably thinking of taking it. So I don't worry about the ones I hear about. I'm more concerned about the ones I don't know that are going on, you know, but I'm sure that'll, right, that'll all come to a head in about four weeks. So. I'm gonna enjoy these next three weeks that I get to coach football and prepare for games and we're gonna work like crazy to try to create another opportunity for this football team. And you know, if you worry about what's gonna happen in four weeks, you don't enjoy the present. You brought up the school's APR. Do you have any thoughts on a particular media outlet projecting you to finish five and seven? yet get a bold bit because of the APR? Well, I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't come to that. Okay, we're working like crazy. But a bold bit would still be... I don't, let's not even go there, Tony, okay? If, if we have to get there game t uh, 12, 
you can go there, but right now we, that's, that's, not, that's not our goal. So we, we want to uh, earn one with our record, and if one needs to be earned with our APR score, that we'll, we'll deal with that in the... I'm trying not to worry about four weeks from now, and you're trying to make me worry about three weeks from now. <laughs> we got a big enough challenge on our hands with NC State this week, and they're a really good football team, and I hope our, our fans will come out and our students will come out and support these seniors. Now, there's going to be a lot of guys walking, and you're going to say, does this mean they're coming back or not coming back? I have no idea. Like, we try to postpone all those discussions till the season's over, and we tell every player, if there's a 1% chance you may not come back, you've earned the right to celebrate your senior day. And so we encourage guys to do it, and then, you know, if they decide to come back later, we'll be very excited to have them. So don't, don't try to, re, you know, obviously with guys like Michael Jurgens and Jacob Roberts and Chalen Garns, they can't come back. Um, but the other guys, you know, that's you know, another negative of having your last home game week 10, you know, is that you have to start having all those discussions with guys because of senior day. So we just said, if there's any chance at all you're leaving, we encourage you to go through senior day so you make sure you have at least one. And some of these guys might have two or three of them, like Jurgens. I, I don't know if he's had two or three, but our flower budget uh, <laughs> for him and his mom has, has gone way up. So when, we, when Michael's extremely, extremely successful in the next five to 10 years of his life, That'll be our opening pitch when we ask for a donation. You always saw this for all the flowers. All right, ready, break.